So, so who had a cheeseburger? Anybody have a cheeseburger? Pretty good, very good. Did you leave any for me? No? Probably not. Any bacon at least? No bacon? Ketchup, maybe. Maybe pickles. Well, listen, my name is Ruben. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Calvary. And it's my privilege and honor to host you here at this conference this afternoon, evening, sorry. And I've got somebody next to me. Mike, bro. tell us who you are, bro. My name is Mike, and I oversee men's ministry here, and I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. And I'm sorry that there are no crazy creatures on my shirt. There's no cr- All right, this is this nothing He's but stripes. He's making fun of my shirt. Nothing, nothing but stripes. Yeah, but guys. Somebody asked me, they said, what is it? Crazy it? creatures. I, said, I don't know. I don't really know. I think it's some sort of a... I have batteries for this shirt. You want to see it? <laughs> you guys want to see it? All you got to do is click right here. All right, listen, we, got, we still look have a lot of guys look. coming in. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Wait, did you just flex? Oh, yes. oh, my God. Okay, here we go. That gives you an idea of what this might be like tonight. Hey, so who do we have here tonight? How many guys are here from uh, some of our regional campuses? Like, how many guys are here from Boca? Let me hear the, the Boca contingency. They say, wow. they say hi. Boca? They say hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Right? No, no, no. They're legit dudes. They what hate about me Plantation? Oh, come on. In, in our next men's event, we're going to get a rope, and we're going to do a tug of war between Boca and Plantation. But the pastors can't participate because those guys are kind of jacked. Anyways, uh, what, what, are, what are some other campuses? What about West, West, uh, West Boca? West Boca. All right. Okay, two guys. We love awesome. you guys. <laughs> I, I should probably mention the Keys right now, and then it's going <laughs> to be good. Anybody from the Keys? See, oh my one goodness. dude from the Keys right now, brother? All right. Hallelujah. Anybody? See? We should, we should do a giveaway for that guy. We should. And any, any and all of our campuses, we're so glad that you're here. We want to take a, just a few moments to have you just decompress. At the end of the day, uh, most of you have, have been busy, and you've had a long week, and, you've had a, and you've, some of you maybe had a long day. We want, to, we want to just ask you to right now just kind of begin the process of just realizing why it is that we're here and what it is that we're going to be doing. Uh, we, want to, we want to offer you an opportunity to just sort of tone down the noise of the world mm. Mm. and be able to really focus on the fact that you are part of a church that cares deeply about relationships, mm. about sex and intimacy and what the Bible has to say about those relationships. Totally. Yeah. And so um, as, as we do that and as we complete to fill the room, I want mm. to do a couple of giveaways. And so I'd like to find out in just a moment... Who, who here has been, uh, let's see, who is the oldest guy here? Wait, wait, hold on, Mike, Mike, you got to no, 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 tell on. him what the gift is. No, first, no, no, I'm, I'm going to tell him after, Dude. after, after, after. He's reaching for something in his pocket. I'm, I'm reaching for something in my pocket. I want to know, who is the oldest guy here? And, and it might be that you're so old, you don't even know how old you are. So you're disqualified. <laughs> but I'm talking about, let me see by show of hands, oldest guy here. The most, most laps around the block. The no, most. you're Stop. John, Look at me. Come on, In men's man. ministry, we have a guy that comes every week only to get the prizes. <laughs> he, he quit coming. I think he opened up a store on eBay. Who's the oldest guy here? Hey, raise your neighbor's hand if you, if you want to. Nobody's here? No. Nobody's. All right, here we go. Right back there. How about Matt Hickman? Who? Matt Hickman. Matt Hickman, you are not old yet. No, come on, no, man. No, 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 no. What about the youngest guy here? This is an event that has men from high school age all the way Wait, this, guy, this guy says guy. he's the oldest one here. Wait, That's you're the cool. oldest guy. How old are you? 76. All right. 76 is, is not that Is that the old. oldest? Is that the oldest guy here? 76? 81. 81. Do I hear 82? <laughs> no? Anybody else? I think the 81 wins it. Hey, let's go to the opposite end. What about the youngest guy here? We have high school age men here tonight. Gift cards, Who's the man. youngest guy here? Now, if you're, if you're 11, and I'm not talking about how old you are mentally. I'm talking about, like, on your birth certificate. So what do we got? Uh-oh. 15. Any, anybody younger than 15? Yeah, that's right. Come on up here and get a gift card. Come on up here. Hey, give this guy a hand. Bro, we're so happy that you're here. I don't want to tell you what we were doing when we were 15 years old. So praise the Lord that you're here at a church event to know how to do it right. Hey, how about married guys? Anybody here been married more than 10 years? Raise your hand. What about 20 years? What about 30 years? Close. To the same person. What about 40 years? Oh, I should have said that first. Huh? You guys are all messed up. 40 years. Do we have a 40? A 50? 
A 50? A 50? No. 40, 45? 46? 40, is that it? It's not the 80 year old. Come on up here and get a gift card, man. Come on up here. We, we got to check the marriage How license. How many years? What was the winner? How many? How many? 45. 45. Good job. 47 years. Oh, 47. Man. Hey, hey, hey. Don't make me call security. Settle down. <laughs> Settle down. You're getting all crazy on me already. All right, so what do we get up there? 55. 55. 55. Oh, that's the guy. That's the guy with the eBay store. <laughs> Go get Hurry, Ruben, give him the card because he'll start a scene. All right. <laughs> Anybody here get married this month? You, you just got married this month. What's up, man? Like, legit, you got married this month? No, but I'm talking about this month of this year. My bad, I didn't clarify. Huh? <laughs> Anybody get married this week? Anybody got married this week? This month? This month is the man right here? Okay, look, look at me. I know what you're doing. Anybody? Hey, that's right. Come on up here. Come on up here. Hey, how long have you been married? Three weeks. Huh? Huh? Hey, this, this is a home product right here. This is a, this is a product of this church. Bro. This is a guy that's doing it right. So here you go. This is a $25 gift card to the grill. So you can buy a burger and a half. You can buy a burger and a half. All right, what about birthdays? Sorry, any, any birthdays this month? Oh, here we go with the 28. I'm 28 all the time. OK. Anybody have a birthday today? Today? How many? Just you? Come on up here, bro. Come get your gift. Happy birthday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look at you know you're in a church in South Florida That's right. when the guys over here are saying, check his ID. <laughs> it's perfect. You guys are perfect. All right. Oh, he did. Oh! <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Hey, happy birthday and God bless happy you. Happy birthday, man. Happy so, birthday. So, so listen, so we have guys here that are, we have guys that are high school age here tonight. Right. We have men that are single. We have men that are married. We have all kinds of, Ruben, you remember when you were in high school? Uh, you know, I, I don't like to remember, but yes, I do remember, yeah, unfortunately. I, I remember, I wasn't doing this kind of stuff when I was in high school, but then eventually we got, That's right. we got out of the house, right? We That's became right. like single, like, single. We were in charge of what? Of the world, yeah, right? Yeah, little paycheck. Nobody tells us what to do. <laughs> little that's paycheck, right. that's right. <laughs> what else? You, you get to do all your own business, right? That's you right. get to do all your own laundry. That's right. And sometimes you soap. That's right. And the whole Every once in a while. And, and, and we were men, and we Dishes. were in charge, and we were free. That's right. And we were single, brave men. Road trips. Yeah, road trips. That's right. And then eventually, God had mercy on us, That's right? That's right. And he did what? M much mercy on me. Much mercy on And much us. mercy on you. That's yeah. very true. Well, I, I got most of my friends still wondering how it is that I tricked her. I promise I didn't trick her. I just, I just tried to be nice. That was it. That was it. But Man. at the end of the day, we're really, really happy to see such a diverse and broad group of men. And at the end of the day, we do have one thing in common, and that is that we are men, and we are desperately pursuing a Savior that has, has already given himself up for us. That's right. You know, when we think about Broward County, and we just mentioned all the campuses, the Tri-County area, and we think about the, the brokenness, really, of our culture when it comes to sexuality and into intimacy. I think about my sons growing up in this in this era, you know, and what they're going to see, what they're going to hear, what they see on top of taxi cabs. You know, that, that's the reason why we really designed this conference for you. And I'm so thankful that we have leaders and pastors who believe in talking about something like this here at our church. And so our prayer, our prayer has been for you uh, that you would be able to come to this place and, and leave with some boundaries and some ideas that you can take into your home, into your own heart, uh, to walk as a righteous man in Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties all across our area for, for the sake of Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Some of you guys are here uh, because God is going to show something to you and reveal something to you, but I believe many of you are here because God wants to utilize you in your history, in your experience, to inspire and to encourage and to walk beside another man. In men's ministry at Calvary Fort Lauderdale, we believe that no man should walk alone. That's, right. That's really been our battle cry because we know that outside of these doors, there is an enemy that hates us. Mm. 
He doesn't dislike you. He's not your enemy and then at the end of the round you shake hands. He's an enemy that wants to see you dead mm. and broken and destroyed. Mm. And so therefore, if I know that I live in that kind of environment, right. I don't want to walk alone. That's I right. want to walk along with a brother that's going to not only have my back, mm. but have my sides. Somebody that'll tell me the things that I don't want to hear, not because it's their opinion, but because they're written in God's word. Mm. And so that's what we hope will happen tonight. Let me give you a little bit of a rundown. We're going to meet in this, in just a few minutes, we're going to have a time of worship. As soon as that's done, we're, we have a tremendous guest speaker that Pastor Doug will come out and introduce, who will speak to us in a general session. Once that general session is over, you're going to be divided into breakout groups based on where you are in life. The married men will stay in this room, and we'll probably just gather up, and we'll just stay right here and handle the topic of sex and intimacy as it pertains to married men. The single men, that means divorced, widowed, and not yet married, uh, you're going to go straight down those center doors and you're going to go to our high school's theater. And over there, there will be pastors doing a breakout session specifically geared towards the single men. And for the high school age young men, you're going to exit right through that exit sign and you're going to make a left and go to our high school ministry room where a young pastor is going to do the same thing, appropriate and directed towards your demographic. So we are excited and looking forward to all the cool things that God is going to do tonight. And we couldn't be more pleased to see you all in this room and, and be a part of this together. Amen. Gentlemen, please stand with us as we worship our great God together. Amen. You guys ready to lift a shout of praise to our God tonight? He's the reason that we can stand. He's the reason that we can run after righteousness together, right? Without him, we can't do any of that. So we're going to worship him to start, tell him how good he is. Before we do, why don't you meet a guy next to you you don't know, make a new friend, and then we'll worship the Lord together. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can 
can't stop the Lord, oh my, there is no one who can stop the Lord, oh my.
How good is our God? Would you shout hallelujah with me? Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Lord, we praise you. We say glory to God. Hallelujah to you, Lord. Every voice in here, Lord, we shout to you because there is no one like you, God. There is no one higher. There is no one greater. And that's why we stand amazed in your presence. We are astounded by your love for us, God. That we wake up today and your mercies are new for us today, God. That doesn't make sense. Such, a, such an all-powerful God to bestow your love on us so freely. Freely for us, but not freely for you. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave everything for us. We stand today as a testimony to your grace. And we say together that we love you. We love you. Be blessed tonight. Speak to our hearts, God. We want to hear from you. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you take a seat? Good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? You know, I like when we get all men together because when you all say hallelujah at the same time, something happens. So we got to say it again on three. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Can you feel the testosterone raging? You know, tonight we're going to talk about the gift and the battle of our sexuality. And as we thought about this event nine months ago, we started praying, who, who can we ask to speak? And so the, the pastor who's going to come, he, he left here from Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale in 2000, right about the time I was coming on staff. And I remember listening to his journey of faith, and I've had the privilege of watching him walk out his faith, planning one of the most vibrant Calvary chapels in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We continue to see and hear stories. Anyone been to Chattanooga, Tennessee? The Calvary Chapel, it's an amazing place. And Frank has been married for 21 years, has five kids, and not only is he a great teacher, but he's a great pastor and leader of people. So please warmly welcome here Pastor Frank Ramsor. Good to have you, bud. Good Thank to you, have man. you. Thank you. Gentlemen, how are you? It's a Friday night. It's a Friday night. You've eaten hamburgers and uh, you've worked all day long. And Mike said it's going to be a tremendous message. No pressure. All right, listen, turn in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we're going to take a look at uh, the most famous one night stand that there's ever been. And uh, it's the most widely publicized affair the world has ever seen. And uh, one of the things, and there are many things about this event uh, that is uh, profound, is that this happened, of course, in the life of one of the most celebrated and uh, beloved of all of uh, the, the, the saints of faith in Scripture. And, of course, I'm talking about King David and his, uh, his fall with Bathsheba. And uh, the fact that this happened in his life is a life lesson in and of itself. And uh, the fact that David is famous for both his sin, which was great, and his heart for God is an entirely another life lesson in itself. And the fact that God literally chose to record for us one of the most tender failures in one of his most beloved saints' lives tells us tons about God. Nevertheless, here we are, front row, the greatest affair ever recorded. And without question, one of God's biggest ideas in recording this for us is that we might be steered away from the same. You know, one of the things that God does from time to time is he'll take a principle that he intends to teach in the positive, but we, he'll, he'll flip it in reverse, and we get a chance to see the negative. And so... He, uh, he uh, sometimes will give us insights to what's right by showing us what's wrong. So here we are, and we're hoping to learn something, as uh, Pastor Doug mentioned, from God about intimacy, our sexuality, God's design, God's desire for it as men. And uh, so he shows us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about what our fallen hearts uh, uh, is prone to be uh, enamored with, if not completely occupied with, and what this world openly celebrates and what the great destroyer uh, perhaps is presently and cleverly designing 
for every single one of us in this room. So in my humble opinion, among other things, God says to all of humanity through 2 Samuel chapter 11, here's the truth about false intimacy. We're going to try to learn some positive things about the way God designed the whole wondrous affair or the experience. But we're going to, we're going to learn the truth about false intimacy. So we're, looking, we're going to be looking for the right stuff from this really wrong season in David's life. Are you ready for the truth? How many say I'm ready for the truth? Are you sure ready for the truth? Okay, here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 11 begins eerily with the words. It happened. In the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. When kings go to battle, David didn't. David didn't go but delegated. You know, one of the... One of the great tensions of leadership is knowing when to do it yourself and when to delegate it. And it becomes abundantly clear, crystal clear, this time David got it wrong. David's in the wrong place at the wrong time. The wisest man who ever lived, his son, Solomon, observed with perfect accuracy. There's a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time for war and there's a time for peace. So we have a great man. Without, we have an incredibly great man about to fall prey to the power of his environment. One of the world's greatest men is in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he put himself there, Craig Rochelle, in his book, Fight. Anybody read this book? Craig Rochelle's got a book called Fight. I recommend it to every man. It's small. There are no pictures. It's a short little read, but it is a powerful read nevertheless. And he writes this. He says, observing Samson, by the way, he says, have you ever noticed that being in the wrong place never helps us do the right thing? Great man about to fall prey to his environment. You know, King David was a man that it it, it appears that everywhere he went and he was victorious in battle, he would set up garrisons, you know, to sort of make sure that he, he gained and kept the victories that were his already. Except he failed to protect himself here. David at this point is essentially alone. There are many people around, but the men that knew David are no longer around. Those those who really know David, they're off fighting Ammonites. So verse 1 tells us when it happened, when David chose the wrong place at the wrong time. Then verse 2 tells us then it happened. One evening... That David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. It happened one evening. It's just one night. Everything in this great man's life is about to change in a matter of moments. Every other day he'll live on the face of the planet will bear the marks of this one night. It happened. Just one night. You ever wish you could have a do-over? You know, you're like, oh, golly gee. I mean, some of us are like, I would take a few decades back. Thank you very much. But if you could get one night, if you could go show up to David and say, I'm going to give you one more night to do-over. I'd submit to you, this would have to be the night. And if it weren't this night somehow, it would have to be the night that he decided, you know what? I'm not going to go to battle. I'm going to stay behind. But regardless, here's the night our wicked hearts are so curious about. Here's the the night culture tells us, you know, is just so great. The night we're never going to forget. Hashtag gross understatement. Never forgot that night. Are you kidding me? Every single other night he put his head on his pillow, he remembered this night. And this is the night in a sense that the devil perhaps has planned for every single one of us in the future if in fact it is the future for the sad realities here, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but a great many of us in here already had the t-shirt and we've got the scars to boot. We've been there. And here's a scary thought. You know, when you look at this man's life, you wonder, or at least I do, we, we believe he's in David's now in his 50s. Anybody, how many of you guys in your 50s? A bunch of old dudes. <laughs> a sad thing. I'm not there yet. I'm just 27, but anyway. (laughs) 
Here's a scary thought. This one night was 50 years in the making for David. And I wonder right now, those of you, how many of you guys are in your 20s? Yeah, could it be, listen, could it be that there's a, there's a clock in the, in the temporary, not eternal, councils of hell. And the dial is set for when you're 50. It's 30 years in the making. Does that ever scare you? 30 years in the making. Could it be that right now in the works is our night, our one night? We would call this, our culture would call this David's one night stand. But whoever named this a stand was uh, sadly mistaken. This was a, there was a stand, it wasn't. It was a horrific fall. And listen, a greater man than you and me, a far greater man than you and me, in the wrong place, the wrong time, stirs from his sleep, takes a walk on the roof. It's possible that the stroll itself was as innocent as no doubt many others that he had taken, or could it be that uh, on, on one of his other nightly strolls in the past, this situation presented itself to him. David had always previously passed the test, but perhaps tonight he's actually hoping to come across a situation like he had seen before, much in the way that many of us serve channels. Tell your brother, thank God my wife's not here. I mean, you're like thinking, bro, don't, don't, be, don't, be, don't be talking about... Yeah, listen, listen, men, let's be honest. We don't serve channels because we're multitaskers. We're not. We aren't multitaskers. You give a guy one thing. I, I think I could, don't, I think I could do that. One thing. Your wife's like, come on, I can, I can she's got it all going. She, strangely, women aren't the ones who do this channel surfing. It's we men. And it's not because we're multitaskers. Right? Anyone here go, okay, you got me. It's true. Yeah, we, we serve channels and we surf the net the same way David may have been cruising the roof. We're looking for something. Uh, my brother says it this way. When desire meets opportunity, there's going to be failure. And David's got a desire in his heart. And here comes the opportunity. He sees this woman bathing. The look wasn't a sin. Seeing what was in plain sight wasn't the problem. It's what he did with the look. The look went further. We're told she was very beautiful to behold. So you guys know the story, right? David knowing himself and knowing his Bible, he takes a cue from Joseph. He runs back to his house instantly. He takes, starts taking a cold shower, gets on his knees and calls his best friend for accountability. Is that what happens? No, no that's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. Verse three. So David sent and inquired about the woman. He Googles her. <laughs> Who's the chick in the Hardee's commercial? Do not raise your hand. Serge comes back, Bathsheba. <laughs> Got to be a stage name, but I like it a lot. <laughs> He's thinking. And he finds out, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? The daughter of Eliam should have stopped David cold in his tracks. This is going to come back to haunt David. Eliam's father is Ahithophel. Ahithophel is one of David's most trusted counselors. The Bible says that when this man spoke, he spoke as if he, he literally spoke the very oracles of God. David owed this man on all kind of counts. Bathsheba is Ahithophel's granddaughter. Now, some of you old dudes, you got some granddaughters out there that you care a little bit about? No, but a man... When his blood boils the way David's did on the roof, it's next to impossible to reason. Probably why Joseph ran in the face of his temptation instead of trying to reason. By the way, in the case of sexual temptation, running is always better than reasoning. Granddaughter of your best counselor, stop! Surely the next word will stop this man of God. The daughter of Eliam, wife of... And this is God's top 10, right? You shall not commit adultery. You're flirting. You flirt. I mean, this, this is dangerous. Wife of Uriah the Hittite. And not just any married woman, which should have been enough. She's married to one of your mighty men. 
So now David runs with this intel. He's like, bro, I have got to cool off. I've got to run away. I've got to get out of here. I've got to go get accountability. I need the cold shower. And off he runs, right? Wrong. No. He sent messengers, took her. She came to him. He lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. It's the, it's the classic one night stand. This is, as, this, is as, this is as false as, uh, in terms of intimacy. This is as far away from God's idea as you could possibly get. This woman was nothing but an object for his passion that was misplaced and unholy. Now, we don't know how the night went. You know, what was it? Some of you old school guys, a little berry white in the background, some strong drinks. Some of you younger kids, Zeds, are you going to stay the night? I mean, I don't know what was going on that night, but nevertheless, they had sex and she went home. It's a one-night stand. It's false intimacy. No commitment, no covenant. Altogether self-centered. Verse 5, shouldn't surprise us then. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Then David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. So now that there's no way to hide the one night stand, David is going to come clean. I'm guessing David acted immediately knowing that time was of the essence. He does ask to, uh, for Joab to go get Uriah. Sadly, it's not to confess anything. Read on verse 7. When Uriah had come to him, David asked, how Job was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, go down to your house and uh, wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. You know what David's doing, right? He's hoping that this guy's gonna come back from battle, spending God only knows how long with a bunch of swell, smelly, nasty dudes. You get a little break. Why don't you go on back to your house? And his wife is beautiful to behold. He thinks all I got to do is get this man to come lay with his wife and the whole thing will be covered up. It's an incredibly disturbing encounter being that it comes from a man like David. David stands face to face with one of his trusted friends, which he has horribly betrayed. Here's two men. These guys had saved one another's life. They had fought side by side, been in the foxhole together. So David sends Uriah home after some really small talk. And how's the war? How you doing? You ever fine? And a little rack of lamb and a side of mandrakes, if you know what I mean. Go ahead, buddy. Get on back to the house. Uriah, Uriah won't go. He won't go home. But stayed at the door of the king's house. Now, I know we drop into the middle here. And if you're not familiar with his life, it's easy for any of us just to forget. But here's what it is that we're watching in this. We're, we're watching David, a man who is, in a sense, famous for not taking matters into his own hands take matters into his own hands. D David knew that God's hands were more capable, but now deceived by sin, David is doing something different. Sin will lie to you, boys. Sin is deceptive. It's deceitful. It not only lies about itself, no strings attached. There's no hook in this proverbial apple. You can do this as long as you want and uh, no one else has to know about it. Sin lies about itself. It lies about us. You can handle this. You deserve this. And it lies about what's coming. <laughs> Nobody's ever gonna find out. And sin lies to us about God. David knew firsthand, God is gracious to those who come humbly when they blow it. He knew this firsthand, but sin has lied to David and sin has him believing that God will not be gracious. Now, I wonder if there's anybody here right now that is in the middle of some kind of bondage and you are convinced that even on a night like tonight and you want it, if you are here and you're a son of God and a child of God, listen, your soul cries for freedom, but you are living in bondage. And if there isn't a man here tonight in the midst of bondage, perhaps for years, and you fear that God will not be gracious to you should you come clean, it's a lie. It's a lie. Whoever you are, wherever you are, this could be the night of your freedom. Solomon later observed, and he articulated this powerful truth. Listen, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but... Whoever 
confesses and forsakes them, not could have, should have, might have, will have mercy. Anybody here digging some mercy? Anybody here like, I'll take some mercy. I'll take a double helping of mercy tonight. Confess and forsake your sin and you will have mercy. Cover your sin and you will not prosper. It's the promise of scripture. It's the promise of God who loves you. You know, we were singing that song. I'd never heard this song before about the, the lion of the tribe of Judah and he roars with power. You know, there are two lions right now roaring in this room, right? First Peter's five lion, he roams around seeking whom he may devour. And then there are some other holy eyes, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who has paid a price to set you free. He here also is looking at you with eyes that blaze like fire. And he's here to set you free. He's here to set you free. But if you cover your sin, you will not prosper. But whoever forsakes, confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So though De, De, here's a man who did almost nothing but prosper in the covering of his sin, he, he, he won't. Verse 10, still trying to cover it up. So when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, did you not come from the journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my Lord Job and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink, to lie with my wife as you live, as your soul lives? I will not do this thing. Now, this is awkward on so many levels. You've, first, you've got to notice the reason the Uriah gives for not going down to his wife. You know, here I am as a son of, I've actually, I learned from you, David, to value the presence of God. And wherever the ark is, that's the presence of God. And so the ark's out there, the presence of God. God is out there and I'm back here. Doesn't seem right. Wasn't too long, if you go back in 2 Samuel, that David was literally on his knees before God right there at that ark, so close. But now the ark is out there on the battlefield and David is back in Jerusalem. There's literally a distance between David and the manifest presence of God and that's when men, great men, sin. When there's distance between God and man. And for a man like David, this had to sting. Any mention of the ark at this very low point in his life had to be uncomfortable to me. And there are many, but to me, another one of the off-ramps that David chose not to take. Right there, right there between the two of them, he mentions the presence of God. And he had an opportunity right then and there to go, this, now's the time. I, I got to come clean. Now's the time. It's just the two of us talking about the presence of God. We've both been there before the presence of God. He's, you're, I mean, this man has confessed his own struggles with me. This is a say. He doesn't do it. And then Uriah's character. He, this is one of the men that was, these were this, they, Uriah is one of the misfits who joined David in the wilderness. Uriah learned true character from David, but one thing leads to another. Now we have an unholy string of things happening in David's life. Verse 12, then David, he says to Uriah, wait here today also. And tomorrow, and I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. So David's thinking to himself, now that everything else has failed, how can I get this man to sleep with his wife? <laughs> Alcohol. Been king of the one night stand from as long as the beginning of time. Work with Noah, did a number on Samson. A whole bunch of us that raise our hands and go, yeah, <laughs> did a number on me, kind of thing of it. There's hardly a man, listen, there's hardly a man who can withstand sexual temptation when there's enough juice on board. And David just needs him to sleep with his wife. He doesn't need him to do anything, you know, he just needs him to sleep with his wife. So David, the man of God, gets another man drunk. It's not impossible for me anyway to think that uh, David had a few the night he strolled across his roof. Could explain how he missed the blatantly obvious off-ramps that God had provided for him along the way. I don't know. But Uriah, a man of faith and principle, even drunk, stands. So now seeing everything come to nothing and realizing sin 
isn't covering his sin is not bringing him any prosperity at all. David finally decides to confess and get it right with God. Is that what happens? In the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle. Retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Job besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there would be valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with, with Joab and some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. An alarming new low for Israel's great king. Not, not only is Uriah's blood, innocent blood, we could say on David's hands, now the blood of innocent others also. There were others here that died in the battle that day. David's secret sin, the point is, didn't only affect his own life. That's another one of the sins. That's another one of the lies that sin tells us. You can do this all by yourself. Nobody else sees it. It'll never hurt anyone else. We've all heard it, right? We've all justified it. Others were affected. Always will. Well, now Uriah is dead. The deed's covered. No one is ever going to find out. And David can happily move on with his life. It must be what he thinks. Verse 18. Then Joab sent and he told David all things concerning the war. And he charged the message saying, when you finish telling the matters of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerob, whatever? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead also. So Joab sends word to David. The, the dude, Joab, by the way, is no saint. This guy already has innocent blood on his hands. David knew where to go when he had to get a dirty job done. You go to a dirty dude. Joab owed David. David could have already put him away because of his own uh, propensity for evil. Perhaps Joab's shady history prepared him to participate in David's dark deed here. If this is true, listen, listen. If it's true that uh, the kind of life that this man lived prepared him for such a dark deed, then it may be that your dark dealings and my dark dealings prepare us for even greater dark dealings. And if that's true, then the life lesson is what? Don't be a shady dude. So Job sends word back. And he says, listen, if the king gets hot, and he's likely to when he hears about the strategy we employed, all you need to do is tell him that Uriah is dead, and that'll settle it. Verse 22. So the messenger went, came and told David all that Job had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, surely the men prevailed against us and came out uh, to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance to the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And... Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Job, Do not let this thing displease you. For the sword devours one as well as the other. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it. So encourage him. David callously tells the messenger, Go ahead, send some encouraging words back to Joab. I'm not upset. It's, everything is gone. Don't worry. Don't worry, Joab. Um, your secret is safe with me. You got my back. I've got yours. You won't have to answer for any military, you know, failure on your part. So now news will reach Bathsheba. Verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing, the thing our culture glamorizes, the thing our wicked hearts find so fascinating, the thing that the devil intends for every single one of us, the thing David did displeased the Lord. Now, we don't know what part Bathsheba played. We don't know if she was, you know, provocatively dressed or fishing on the roof. I mean, she was bathing. Uh, we, could she have refused the king's advance? There's so much we don't know. But we do know that we've got a married woman, now pregnant with another man's child. 
And that man who is the father of this new child is responsible for the death of her husband. And that man is David, whom the scripture calls a man after God's own heart. So unlike our broken culture and our very wicked hearts and our devious enemy, God will tell us the truth about false intimacy. He's not done. There's so much more to tell. Read on tonight if you're not familiar with how this all turns out for now. But for now, I want to point out just a couple things that we cannot afford to miss before we dismiss and meet within our groups. There's one thing. You've probably picked up on it by now. There's one thing. There's a few things we can't afford to miss. We just simply can't gather together like this on a Friday night. This is an incredible opportunity. It's a holy moment. It's a wonderful gathering. There's a few things that we cannot afford to miss. But one of them. First, if you're taking note, you can write, I am not above this. Write it down. I am not above this. Greater men have fallen farther than we. And uh, if even for, if even for the, the, a flash of a second in your mind, you thought to yourself in the midst of this story, I'm so familiar with the story, this could never happen to me, watch out. Do you think there isn't a lesson from God to the world that the fact that the greatest one night stand the world has ever seen happened in David's life? You think there's not a message in that? You don't think there's a message in that? The greatest one night stand, the greatest false intimacy the world has, knows anything about happened in the life of a man named David. You, you, don't think that, you don't think there's a lesson in that. There isn't a one of us above this kind of collapse of faith and moral character and failure. Listen, this is, it isn't monsters and perverts who fall prey to this. It's great men of character and great men of faith. We're not above this men. Number two, sexual sin is an inside job. Sexual sin is an inside job. Do you, did you not also think that there's a life lesson to the world from the greatest one night stand in the history of the world that it was a man who fell who had no shortage of sexual options. At this particular point, David has eight wives and concubines beside. Someone thinks, well, bro, I mean, the Bible did say she was very beautiful to behold. The Bible also says the very same thing about one of his other wives, Abigail, right now. What's the point? The sexual sin isn't a matter of temptation from the outside, her outsides, but David's insides. Listen, his heart lusted like ours do. His heart lusted. David had desires like all men have desires, but he let those desires get out of line. And we just, we literally just read the perfect reality. Perhaps this is exactly what was going through none other than the brother of Jesus Christ, James, when he wrote these words. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. That's James chapter 1. Is this not exactly what it is that we just read? David's desire enticed him, leading him to sin. And David's sin led to death. And since sexual sin is an inside issue, it must be dealt with in an inside way. And tonight we have that chance. Tonight we have that opportunity. Number three, choose your environment wisely. <laughs> choose your environment. Young men, choose your environment wisely. 
old men, men that have been married for three decades, choose your environment wisely. A great man in the wrong place at the wrong time royally screwed up. When kings go to battle, David didn't. It's hard to do the right thing in wrong places. Choose your environments wisely, young men. When desire, so I talked about this inside issue. When desire meets opportunity, and typically desire meets opportunity when we're in the wrong place at the wrong time, then there's going to be failure. There was a desire in his heart for something that fell outside of the parameters of God's best. And all I needed was the opportunity. When desire met opportunity, there was failure. I'm going to guess that there are some men here that have an absolute love-hate relationship with their phones. I need this. I hate this. Your computer. I need this. I hate this. Because you've got desires and the opportunity, not like when a lot of us grew up, it's in your back pocket heavy. It's heavy. And here's the real burden of my heart. You ready? I want you to write this down. Listen, for a whole bunch of people, it's going to matter. It could matter so much. Not only for you, but those you love so much, your kids, your wife. Listen, come clean before you get caught. One of the most profound thoughts to me when I look at David's life and we don't have an answer. But listen, (laughs) the simple possibility that it exists is worth its weight in gold. If you know anything about what happens in this man's life and 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 the lives of those that he loves, his daughters, his kingdom from here on out, from this day forward, Listen, the most profound thing to me is all the time that we're dealing with nine months of a cover-up, right? The child shows up. And all kinds of off-ramps that he doesn't take. Until finally, in chapter 12, God has to send Nathan the prophet to say, dude, you are the man. Here's my question. Is it possible that the horrific consequences that mark the rest of David's life could have been, hey, minimized if not completely wiped away if David would have just, like he'd done so many other times before when he blew it, come clean, come clean before he got caught. God promises you and me the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure it. God faithfully, even when David was in the wrong place at the wrong time, provided many off-ramps, but David didn't take them. Here's my exhortation. Men, tonight, let's take the off-ramp. You go, which one? This one right now. This one right now. This very night, this very season, and it is possible, and I'm not trying to be dramatic, but it is possible that if you will come clean before you get caught, you could spare a virtual hell from being leashed in your family's life, in your life, and on your Children, anybody think like that would be a good idea? Imagine David being a part of a gathering like this. You know? He wasn't, but imagine David being a part of a gathering like this and having an opportunity. I promise you, as God is my witness, if David were standing here right now, he would say, my brothers, you have no idea how much it's going to cost you if you keep covering it up. Remember the verse we read? It's profound. 
Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. Check it out. But whoever, anybody, any whoever's in here? Whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That's God's invitation to every single one of us in this room. You know, I kind of, Doug asked me to come and speak about uh, this whole God's design for sex. And I had in my mind a lot of different ways in which we could go. But I thought, I don't know how many of us are in here. We're all male. Every single one of us knows the struggle. Every single one of us knows the fight. Every single one of us is living in a culture that does nothing to help us walk in righteousness. We are fighting together against a devil who hates marriage. Right? That's what we're doing. And it would be the most, it would be the epitome of foolish to gather together like this, get to this particular point and say, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I mean, I'm so deep in. I'm so deep in. No way out. Can't be the case. It's not the case. You cover it. And not, aren't you tired of running against the wind? You put your head down on your pillow at night and you know. It's like the shadow has come in between you and the son of God. You're saved. He loves you. He's never going to stop loving you. You're here tonight because he loves you. He's pursuing you right now. The lion of the tribe of Judah is roaring into your soul saying, son of God, stand up. Stand out. Come clean. Listen, the only reason God Almighty, the only reason God exposed David's sin was to heal him. Not to condemn him. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. The lion of the tribe of the Judah, he is a healer. And there's a heart sickness and our problem with lust. By the way, as long as we feed on every other image, we will have nothing left over, let alone holiness in our minds for our own spouses. Make no provision for the flesh, brothers, to obey it in its lust. That's why a lot of us don't have satisfying sex lives because we've already had sex a whole lot before we even get to the bedroom. This is a great opportunity. This is a great opportunity. Father in heaven, here we are. A room full of guys. Something about a guy, you made us this way. You're for us, you're not against us. You're for every marriage. There are wives in this room that are in jeopardy. There are little children in this room that are in jeopardy. We're being lied to by sin, lying about us, lying about itself, lying about God, lying about what's coming. And it's the truth that sets us free. I do want to pray in Jesus' name that tonight is not just any other night. That tonight, the night, that horrible night and the consequences will be snuffed out by your great grace. I pray for an unusual boldness in the lives of these men. In the context of of this safe environment of brothers. I mean, there's not another brother in here that would condemn another brother for being involved in sin. He who covers will not prosper. But he who confesses, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Let tonight be a night of healing freedom, victory, and protection. Lion of the tribe of Judah, roar over us and shake us free from the claws of our own wicked hearts, this sick and perverted world, and that gnarly devil who wants to kill and steal and destroy. In Jesus' name, and every man in this room says,
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. Thank you, and God bless you. Man. Oh. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, so look at. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Not only a powerful message from the Bible, but for some of you, maybe awfully uncomfortable right now. Take a deep, deep breath. And remember that greater is he that is in you, that is in us, that is in this room, than he that is in the world. And so, breathe for just a moment. Because I can feel that there's people in this room I can't wait for those doors to open so you can just be gone. So take a deep breath. Now we're going to move on with the rest of our evening that God also has planned for us. So the married men are going to stay in this room. And, and, and like I said, we're going to we'll just kind of get a little bit tighter and we have a, a panel of pastors and speakers and we're going to have conversation. Single guys, you're going to go straight back through these center doors and don't rush right now, but you're going to go right back through these center doors and go into the theater. It's a straight shot. If you need to use the restrooms, they're marked throughout the sanctuary. You need a quick drink of water. We need you to be efficient with your time. It's not a break. It's not a time for you to discuss the pastor's message, but right now it's a time to get to your breakout session. Young men, high school guys, you're going to go right through the exit sign over there and head over to the high school ministry room. And then once your breakout sessions are done and you finish through your Q&A session, as you go into your rooms, you're going to get little note cards that you can submit some questions for discussion. After Q&A, we will reconvene in this room right here, and Pastor Doug will address us once again as a group. So go in peace and walk carefully but quickly, and we love you. We'll see you soon. <laughs>